it's an insane amount of pressure that we women put ourselves through and then we face the guilt because we can't do it all. But no one talks about the psychological death that a woman especially goes through. It is literally like stepping off a cliff into an abyss of the unknown. Dr. Shafali, welcome back to Women of Impact. Oh, I love being here. I just love talking with you about all things that we women go through. Ditto, girl. And so today, what I really want to focus on is I heard a stat that 90% of marital uh, couples, their spark dives in the first year of having children. Yeah. What the hell is happening? Why are our relationships so difficult where we work hard to find love, to keep love, and then within the first year of having a child, it completely dips. Oh my goodness, are you kidding? This is, you know, having children is the big, the biggest libido buster ever. Like you, you, you don't have kids, so your libido is running high. But for all of us who have a child, first it's just such a psychological shock and no one prepares you for it, you know? Everyone's so focused on the baby and everyone's so excited that you have this new arrival, but no one talks about the psychological death that a woman especially goes through. And of course, then the couple and of course the father, but the mother more so because she had to, you know, expand her body. Her one body became a house for two and then back to a house, to one. It's such a huge uh, change. So of course it affects the couple. The, there's exhaustion, there's sleep deprivation. You're taking care of a new being that you've never met in your life before. You, you've never probably been a parent in, if it's your first child. So all this takes such an emotional toll and it bleeds into the couple. The woman's sex drive is probably on an all-time low, given all the changes she's going through. And of course, there are exceptions. Many women often say that, oh, I was my sexiest and horniest when I first gave birth, but I think that's rare. And so the, the father, if it's a traditional relationship, the male in the, in the partnership goes through this kind of abandonment, you know. They are replaced by this baby in the bed sometimes. And so the couple goes through this enormous change that no one prepares them for and they need to have solid communication skills, solid understanding, great empathy. The man kind of, if it's a traditional relationship, the male is left in a lurch, the woman, the female is left in a lurch because she's having to take care of this child. So it's a huge impact. It is traumatizing. Oh God, that was yeah. so fun. Okay, let's really dig deep here because as we start to talk about deciding to have children, right? Like, so the, the myth, and we spoke about this in the last episode, you know, with it's like first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby right. in a baby carriage and how that has set up so many of us um, on the wrong foot. And I remember when I first met you, I was like, okay, you're an expert on parenting. I was really nervous to tell you I decided not to have children. I was really nervous because I thought you were going to be like, but children are the most biggest blessing. And the first words out of your mouth when I was like, hey, I've decided not to, you're like, oh, it's probably best that you don't. And I was so shocked by a, a person that's an expert in the parenting field to suggest that. So let's go down the path right now about deciding to have kids. Yeah. So you even said like that becomes like almost a death to potentially the, the partner right. because they've lost the spouse, they become second. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that. And then the psychological impact that you said was like, that hit me for yeah. a ton of bricks. It, it's, it's huge and I know I, I have a voice of pessimism or doom and gloom about this. Why? Because parenting is the most difficult job in the world. And I don't think we understand just how difficult it is. We set ourselves up, we have all these fantasies, all these expectations, and then when they come crashing, we think we're doing something wrong. Well, let me first say, Parenting should never be a one-person or two-person job. It should have been how it used to be back when, when we used to raise children as a collective. Mm -hmm. So there were the aunties, the grandparents. There was a support system. You know, leaving a child to just one neurotic person or two neurotic people is not healthy for the child. The child needs many neurotic people <laughs> so they can choose a little bit of this uncle and a little bit of that crazy auntie, but they get a wide variety, a diverse upbringing that is actually healthier. They need to grow up with other children and with other adults. So this nuclear family system has constricted 
our options and really our, our well-being and our children's mental health. So right there, we're starting mm. on the kind of wrong foot. Can I just add yes. a, one question then? So what about now as society, a lot of women are saying, well, I don't necessarily need a man to have a child. Right. And so I'm going to go off and either have a surrogate Right. Um, there's obviously many choices. Right. In that situation, are you saying now that it's actually now even worse for children because now you literally only have one neurotic person? Well, it's not worse for the children as much as it's worse for the adult. Oh. The adult has to manage this child on their own and it's a lot to manage today, right? Because they have to go to school, then all the burden of all the extracurriculars that now children have to do. This one parent is spinning their wheels and then if they are the breadwinner, I mean, it's an insane amount of pressure. And just to talk about the pressure that we women feel, I think there's this saying, this adage now that we women can do it all. We can do it all, but not all at the same time. And I think the mother goes through this burden of shrinking her body back, being sexy again, and being there for her partner, and then having a career, and raising a child, then child number two. It's an insane amount of pressure that we women put ourselves through and then we face the guilt because we can't do it all, you know. So we, we, we skim through magazines where these women are back in the gym in, in six days and then having child number two a year later. It's an impossible expectation and no one will do it beautifully, you know. So let me just talk about when we decide to have a child, most of us decide it unconsciously because it's part of the checklist. That's why I was so applauding of you because you made a different daring decision for yourself. You checked in and you and Tom decided consciously that this was not for you, at least right now. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't do that check-in process. So we just go down the checkbox list and we think it's what we're meant to do. And you know, then it's not anything like our expectation. Some of us may have postpartum depression, and so that just adds to the mix. And then we have this guilt, this crushing guilt. And all of it comes out where? Into our dynamic with our children. So the children then feel the burden to make mom or dad happy, to fulfill their expectations and their fantasies. Now the child is you know, wearing the mask, we call it the mm -hmm. ego mask of trying to please mom and dad. And then the generational pattern continues. So choosing to have children today in the modern world, given that women want to have careers and they want to be, you know, really looking sexy and they want to have a, a great relationship with their partner and they're doing it without a tribe mm -hmm. is a huge burden, which shouldn't be taken lightly. They need to really tap in like you did and consciously assess if this is something that they, they really can do, they want to do. Being maternal and putting your maternal instincts and that role as your top priority, especially when your children are growing up. Sure, you may have a great partner, but you have to still be the primary caregiver is something you need to assess. You know, I didn't realize what it would take for me. I couldn't go full throttle on my career until my daughter was at least 10 years old. I wrote books, but I couldn't go on tours. I couldn't travel. So I had to prioritize, but I did it without resentment. I, I literally was about to ask yeah. you, how do you do it without resentment? Yeah, because I knew that my maternal role was my top priority and I embraced it. I loved it. I wanted it. I wanted to learn from my child. So I created the space in those first 10 years to be there as much as I could. Now, I still did a PhD, I still wrote books, but I wasn't out there in the world as I am today because I needed to be there physically present. But that was something I chose. And because I chose it, I was able to embrace it. There were moments that I regretted, you know, I was like, damn, this is like, this is a 24 seven job. You know, it is because I didn't have the support I needed. You know, my family was back in India, so I was doing it all alone. I wasn't wealthy, so I couldn't hire help. So it was all me. Mm. So had someone warned me, maybe I would have buttressed myself with greater support. But I tell women all the time, the women who are mothers, listen, you chose this consciously or unconsciously, but now the children are here. Instead of splitting yourself up in hairs, you know, I want to be a career woman. I want to, you know, go to the gym six hours a day. I, you know, I want to travel the world. You have to just zone in on this priority. You have to be here now. 
conscious parenting takes presence. And yes, you could be traveling the world, and yes, you could be a really successful ballet dancer, but not right now. Mm. Right now, you need to enter the present moment. The children are here, and they need you. And when you really surrender to the hard, intense labor that parenting is, and stop fighting all the things you could have been, then you actually embrace this journey and you get the jewels of this journey. Listen, th I say it every third sentence, there is nothing harder than parenting, but you will make it even harder if you resist it. Mm -hmm. You have to surrender to this 24 seven nature. They are clingy, they are needy, they are dependent, they will suck the life out of you, they are expensive. It, they are not grateful. They may not even, you know, give you one trophy that you could show off on Facebook with. Like my kid had no trophies. It's a thankless job, but the beauty of it is also, you know, just inexplicable. The beauty of this relationship is also like no other mm -hmm. because you get to see how loving you are. And for me personally, and how I teach conscious parenting, it's you get to bust your ego. So for me, it's a spiritual practice. I use my relationship with my child as a, a meter, a metric of how egoic I am today. And every moment with my child is an opportunity to release that ego. So for me, it's a spiritual metamorphosis, a spiritual test. And that's why I talk about conscious parenting so much, because it's for the parent, the parent to evolve to the higher level of consciousness than ever before. Oh, that was so deep, girl. There were so many questions that I have there. So if you're in this situation where I hear everything you're saying, it just doesn't feel real to me because I don't have a child. Yeah. So in thinking through, okay, that it's hard, it's like they suck the life out of you, it's a thankless job, but there is this beauty. Yes. In that moment, I take that for truth. But when we're talking about like relationships with your partner and yes. how you have a life that you just feel is still your own, mm -hmm. um, how do you start to navigate that? Because if your child becomes that first position, yes. so like take me and Tom, we've been together for 22 years. He's been my number one in my life. I've been his number one in his life. And so now comes an opportunity that is going to be maybe the light of my life. But now it, it does impact my relationship with my husband. And so when I think about how many people end in divorce, right, it's like, what, 50%? So 50% right. of people end in divorce. Around 90% of people are their romance completely dies while having a child. It's like, how do we help maybe women making a decision to have a child, but still allow them to have their dreams because from what I hear you say, it's like it's almost like you're putting your dreams on pause to focus on your child. And then also you're putting your relationship with your partner on pause. And it just sounds heartbreaking. <laughs> well, you're painting it as if it's an either or. And I totally get that. It does feel at times like imagine. If I'm an entrepreneur and I have a super, you know, high powered business meeting the next day, but my kid falls ill. Mm -hmm. and my husband's traveling or my partner's traveling. What, what do I prioritize? The child will have to come first. So in that case, it's an either or. But on a day-to-day -day basis, instead of looking at it as an either or, which will immediately build, build resentment, it's better to just see it as an expansion of the couple, an expansion of the self. What am I gaining from this? What am I learning from this, right? If I look at it mm. in the negative, there are plenty of negatives. So now the children are here. So how can I embrace this? But you are right in saying that, you know, the dreams can't be the big dreams because this, this, these children need you. Right. So you have to negotiate and you have to ask yourself, what is more important for me right now in this decade of my life? Can I surrender to these children and see the growth, see the expansion, you know, and, and you, you said you, you're not a parent. You're right. But you are a parent of little Lisa, mm -hmm. right? So when you parent a real child, you get even more of an opportunity to parent that inner child. And that's what conscious parenting is about, to see the parenting relationship as an opportunity to not just parent the child before you, but the inner child. Mm. And that's what our children teach us, I can tell you, like no other human being. The, the adult relationship is powerful to help us reparent our children, but our real children, Oh my goodness, they take us right back to our childhood and they challenge us to 
to grow into the parts of ourselves that we did not get to grow into in childhood. So the opportunity to reparent ourselves, and that's what this book is all about, The Parenting Map, because it's all about how can the parent reparent themselves through their relationship with their children. And that opportunity, you can only get with your children. Oh my God, I love that. Yeah, the ego masks, I'd love to talk about yeah. that um, and how we identify what's in us and then how we kind of are projecting. Um, that is fascinating. Definitely want to go down that rabbit hole. And um, before we do that, I really want to touch on when making the decision, because this is where it's like, okay, if you're on the fence, you're not quite sure. Um, I just assume there's no right or wrong answer. It's going to be an individual decision. But even in that individual decision, there's no going back. So the decision no is really back. freaking heavy. Like Life sentence, yes. <laughs> Life sentence, I Many love Many lives, yes. So in, in, one, in looking at the decision of whether you um, want to, I was about to say should, there is no yeah. should here, if you want to or not, there are many different reasons that I hear that I'd love to actually really break down with you um, to help guide. So I know a lot of people will say, you know, um, if I have a baby, it will fix my relationship. Oh, yes, yes. So if we don't mind going through a couple of these, um, I think it would really help people that maybe are on the fence decide. Yes. So the f if people haven't yet had the child and are, you know, exactly, in the deciding yeah. process, they first need to uncover their unconscious assumptions about what this creature is going to do for their lives. Because many of us have these fantasies. Oh, if I have a child, I'm going to have somebody to love and who's going to love me back. So this mythical idea of this free-flowing, unconditional love is one of the reasons Typically, we yearn to have a child, actually, mm. because we imagine that this child will love us and we'll experience this undying love, okay? So that's one of the main reasons people say they want to have children. Another very common one is, you know, the relationship is floundering, the relationship doesn't feel like it's got its juice, so they imagine that this child will come and pump up the relationship. Oh my goodness, they couldn't be more wrong because as I said, it's going to really bust up the relationship. It's not a booster for the relationship. Does it boost it though initially? I can see like you kind of come in together for this collective, oh my God, we're having a child together. Yes, I think when, if you're having a biological child mm -hmm. and during those nine months, there's this idea that, oh, we, are, we have created something magical together. And in, it really feeds the ego mm -hmm. that we've both got this little being that we've created. And then when this being actually comes and you don't recognize them or you can't control them, and this being has its own temperament and its own mentality and its own opinions, very quickly then you begin to have difference you know a difference in parenting a difference in attitude your philosophies come into question there's nothing like parenting to bring your value systems as a couple out into the light like never before mm. because you begin to argue about things that you didn't even know you needed to argue about such as you know uh, should you uh, you know have uh, diapers or do you should you have cloth or you should you buy diapers should you have this kind of milk or soy milk or almond milk mm. now you're arguing about things that you never needed to argue about every little thing comes into question and you have to examine yourself like you never did before so that's another reason people think they should have children and another one is just that they want to fit in you know they want to fit in with what women in their de you know what couples in that decade of life typically do especially in their 30s to 40s everyone's having a baby you feel left out you want to belong and another one is just something very primal you know it could be a biological sense that the female has that my bio biological clock is ticking and that could be real mm. this sense this desire to nurture to caretake and uh, one more unconscious reason is simply because my culture says it's something we have to do you know you know you you face that as a Greek woman right yeah. that Greek women they are they are natural born mothers so many of us feel that it's something that is culturally imposed culturally sanctioned but the except for the biological one all the others need to be really examined deconstructed questioned assessed talk to other parents you know go live with someone who has a newborn baby try it out for real life having a pet is not the same thing you know <laughs> people are like oh i have pets no it's not the same thing go and actually try it out because it's a 24 7 life sentence 
thank you for breaking that all down. And as you were talking, the thing that really stands out to me is the fear part of it, right? Yeah. Almost the fear to not be accepted, the fear to be maybe ostracized, the fear that I'm going to regret it. Like, yeah. And even with the biological clock, one is still actually very, um, I think, strong fear that a lot of us have that if I don't decide now, what if I regret it? Right. And so we then potentially make decisions out of the fear based of the future potential, Definitely. then it really is the now. So how do you help women specifically make, help decide or help yeah. um, navigate that decision? Well, you know, ideally, you would want to go on a meditation retreat, you would want to really check in with yourself, assess for a year or two, you know, hang out with children, really try it out. But even if you did all that and you still decided to have a child, it is literally like stepping off a cliff into an abyss of the unknown. There was no way I could have predicted even one moment of my parenting. And every time I thought I got it down pat, like, oh, we're on a roll, the next minute it spins you on, on your head. This is the nature of raising children. That's why you need to take it really seriously as much as you can preemptively, but also then once you have them, now they're here. And you, you have to embrace it if you want to truly get the most out of it. Fighting the reality of them being here, being resentful of the fact that they're here, uh, feeling bitter is just going to create this dysfunctional relationship that's going to make your life harder. Mm -hmm. Now that they're here, we got to surrender, go with the flow, and there is great beauty to it as well. Uh, I love that. And you do talk about the beauty, and so I'd really love to dive into that. Um, but first, identifying the ego mask. I thought this was really freaking strong that you wrote in your book because to your point, it isn't even just about the identifying your ego mask for the relationship with your children. It really is identifying the ego mask for yourself yes. so that you actually know how you're showing up. Yes, yes. So the core of conscious parenting that I teach, and I really began teaching it because I saw my own ego in full fury when my daughter was young. I was aghast because I thought I would be this ever-loving, ever-present, gentle, patient parent. But all I was was in my ego, but I could recognize it. Mm -hmm. My meditation practice mm -hmm. allowed me to see the ego. And when I saw the ego, I, I wondered, you know, am I the only parent who has this ego? Why isn't, why isn't it being talked about? And I realized, ah, no one wants to talk about this because it's the shame of parenting. Mm. One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner PDF. But unless we uncover this, we will not truly become conscious. So I began to use my own parenting journey in my teachings, allowing me to understand how it is these ego masks show up in our parenting. So my ego mask, for example, was the mask of the fixer. I wanted to fix everything in my child's life and she should never cry. I'm still super protective of her feelings, her moods, her emotions. And I realized that it was a mask I had been wearing all my life. So. Just to be brief, when we come into the world, into our parents' lives, in our childhood, we come in kind of unbounded, uh, free, ready to be who it is we choose to be. But because of the circumstances and the conditions of our childhood, we quickly realize that who it is we are is not being honored. Like, oh, I have to be something in order to get the love, approval, validation, and praise from my parents. And children learn very quickly to give up who it is they authentically are in order to get the crumbs of connection. So they give up, connect, they give up their own authenticity, their connection to themselves, to get the connection from others. Mm -hmm. And how do they do that? By becoming, by wearing a mask that they realize that their parents approve of very quickly. So we can become uh, the super achiever, the super stars, the super pleasers, uh, the super good ones, the good girls, the good boys. And we wear these masks because we realize, ah, when I wear that mask, my mother's face just lights up. 
and I feel worthy. So we give up connection to ourselves for connection to our parents. And these masks become embedded and become our way of being. And we don't even realize that we have these false personas that we wear out into the world. Now, then we become parents, right? And we don't realize that we will live and wear a mask with our children. We think we, we just love unconditionally. So the first step is to become aware that we could wear these masks. And I talk about the five masks. I would love if you don't mind breaking them down. They're so powerful. Yeah. So I, I fashioned these masks based on the primal survival instincts of freeze, fight or flight. So based on that, I created these masks. So I could talk about the fighter mask the fixer mask, the feigner, who's the attention-seeking mask, the freezer, and the fleer. And each of these masks are triggered when we are in a state of helplessness or anxiety. So the minute our children make us feel anxious, we revert to a mask that we've always worn that gets us what we need in the moment. So the typical one is the fighter. You know, I think there's no parent who hasn't been a fighter once or twice. <laughs> um, but we're talking about chronic patterns here. And the fighter is the exploder, the screamer, the yeller, who just shifts into the gear of super control. Mm. You know, and most of us parents have been told that we are in control. But then when you have a child and you realize, you know, a humbling realization is how little control you have. I mean, like zero. Like, first when they're an infant... You can't control their pooping, their lack of sleep, their colicky, you know, irritability. You can't control any of it. Mm. But you kind of are okay with the infant because at least when you put them in the crib, they stay there. Okay? <laughs> but then when they start walking and talking, that's why we call it the terrible twos. Right away, it becomes terrible. Yeah. Because they are terrible. Like, they are not getting under our control. Mm. So control is is our biggest focus and our goal. And when we realize we don't have control, we get anxious and we wear these masks. So the fighter is all about control. The fixer mask, the one that I'm really good at wearing, uh, is where you just rush in and you save the day and you just over-coddle, over-protect, over-rescue. Like, you just take over and manage the moods and the feelings. Again, the fixer, many good girls, you know, the archetype of the good girl, I think you were one, mm -hmm. I was one, we are really good at being fixers. But what we do in wearing the fixer mask, even though we're so nice, is that we rob our children of their governance, of their initiative, of their autonomy. Each of these masks robs mm -hmm. our children of their own inner knowing. The Feiner mask, F-E-I-G-N-E-R, Feiner, is the mask worn by, you see this in parents who are like the stage mom parents or the, you know, the sports dad parent, you know, to use stereotypes, mm -hmm. the ones who need their children to like win the trophy and succeed and take the picture. And, and that parent is just so uh, into their own image and how their family looks and the picture perfect family that they're missing out on what their children need. Mm. And then the freezer and the fleer parents come from more trauma where they simply cannot show up for their children's big emotions. I mean, talk about needing to show up for another's big emotions. You have to show up for Tom's emotions, but Tom does the work. Mm. He is, has a therapist probably. He's taking care of his emotions. Imagine having two or three children who have no idea how to take care of their emotions. Now you have to take care of their emotions. So if you've faced any trauma around your feelings as a child, if you've typically suppressed your feelings, then the fleer and freezer mask is what you're going to wear. You're going to completely freeze when your child has big emotions, which is typically at least three or four times a day, if not a week, right? So that mask comes into play because it protects you. You don't have to deal. You check out. You abandon your kid, really. Uh, but it's really causing dysfunction in your relationship. So when a parent is unaware of these masks they wear, then they show up for their children with that mask. So what that means is that they are reacting to their mask and they're in their own fear instead of responding to what their children need from them in the moment. And children are watching you. They are observing you. They are absorbing you. They are ingesting you, indoctrinating you, internalizing you. So the, imagine now you have these eyes on you. It was one thing to be dysfunctional on your own. But now you have all these <laughs> eyes and you're responsible for how they're taking you in. 
and and you're seeing them take you in mm. and you're like oh goodness i just messed up with my kid but that's all par for the course that's all part of this journey and that's why you learn self forgiveness you learn self compassion you learn to heal yourself because you see your child beginning to mirror you and you begin to see how yet you have to grow mm. so if you are wanting to be a conscious parent right there you are offered jewel after jewel to ask yourself oh my goodness how am i showing up for my kid what was that about why did i just lose my temper and it's an unbelievable opportunity invaluable mm. to look in the mirror to go inward and to heal yourself to go wow my kid didn't want to have scrambled eggs and i lost my shit <laughs> like what was that about what that was about was you weren't being heard our kid wasn't listening to us so look at that mirror to look at how our inner child is screaming to be seen heard and understood that's why parenting is such a powerful teacher if you want to be a conscious parent it can teach you how to elevate to heal to grow to take care of your inner child when you become a parent you don't even realize how insane your inner child is how out of control your inner child is the way you just broke it down was so amazing and as you were talking i was wondering how though like cuz so everyone wants to be seen and then in a relationship i think that's one of the biggest right. things right of right. like what makes a great relationship right. is being seen right. so as you were breaking it down i can understand why i'm doing all the work of the you know inner child what mask am i wearing my kids freaking out okay the inner child in me is like control 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 yes. Yes. like self soothe But then it becomes like okay I'm not getting seen here but now in a dynamic in a relationship where maybe all of my attention is to the kid yes. I'm trying to be seen by the kid yes. but now I'm not actually seeing my partner Yes Yes How do you navigate that Well if you are unconscious it's a big hodgepodge mess and mm-hmm. most of us are unconscious listen I was unconscious for the first 3 years of my child's life like fully unconscious mm-hmm. I had no idea what I was doing it was so overwhelming I was so exhausted but if we step into consciousness what actually begins to happen is you begin to see your inner child more clearly because of your dear children <laughs> but then you begin to see hopefully your partner's inner child and so you you begin to understand more wow because you remember perhaps that your partner told you a story that when they were 3 years old they were locked outside the house and now you have a 3 year old so then you really have compassion mm. right and you have compassion for yourself wow my mom abandoned me for 2 years when i was 5 years old say I, my mom didn't mm. but say that, <laughs> right. that was the case and then you see your own 5 year old now you have compassion for yourself wow i was so little I didn't know any better mm-hmm. right you begin to truly see how uh, abused we may have been as as when we were children and we have more compassion for ourselves so we can go back and reparent soothe ourselves forgive ourselves release our parents also because our parents mm-hmm. were also children once and they had inner children that were also not seen so becoming a parent really can open your heart up to the pain of the universe i remember a moment when i really messed up with my child um and i hurt her i my heart opened so wide to all the pain of all children in the universe because i hurt her and i saw it firsthand and i also realized all the pain that my parents may have caused me and their parents caused them because i saw how easy it is to be unconscious So I kind of forgave everyone in my life for causing me pain. I began to understand how pain is caused because I saw myself doing it to my child. Because I saw the power of unconsciousness. So the parenting journey is such a profound opportunity for us to heal ourselves, to heal our children and then future generations, to forgive our parents, to connect to other people. Now I see the pain in other people so clearly. My child showed me that because I saw how vulnerable making uh, being a child is and how we were all once children and we were all not seen and therefore we all created these egos so I can see hey that's a toddler even though it's a 60 year old I'm like that's a toddler right now you know I always say we're toddlers walking around in tuxedos you know <laughs> we are and ball gowns because we never grew up because we were never seen for who it is we are so it's hard to understand that intellectually but when you have a when you have a child and you see how you yourself don't see your child 
then you begin to realize how you were not seen mm. and how you were not seen and how you were not seen and you have compassion for all of us all of us humans are walking around with this great desire to be seen as whole as worthy but our parents were not seen as whole and were as and worthy so they can't see us as whole and worthy so that's how the generational patterns continue mm. and so how do you how do you actually then break those patterns? So for me, it was very difficult because I was the first person in my entire family in all history yes. to be like, I don't, like actually decide I do not want children. And so it was very difficult for me to not only stand within, like strong within myself, to then discuss it with my husband, come on to this, get on the same page with my husband and then tell my family and then deal with the outside yes. world of all yes. the judgment, shame, selfishness that comes along with making a decision that's going to rub people the wrong way or go against their expectations. So. In understanding all of that, how do we start to make those first steps so that we can actually feel good about ourselves? Because that seen part, and this is why I really want to hammer this home, is that sometimes if we make a decision that goes against expectation, we're no longer seen. Yes. And yes. so in order to be seen, we make decisions that actually aren't aligned with ourselves. Yes, yes. So the ultimate spiritual practice really in life is to begin to see yourself. So when you begin to see yourself, what that means is that you give yourself the permission to detach from your excessive attachment and neediness to be seen by the external world. This is the core principle of any spiritual practice. You have to detach from the external world and really engender a deep connection to yourself. Conscious parenting is an act of the bravest, the most courageous, because to become a conscious parent or to endorse conscious parenting out in the world like you do, is to partake in a revolution. What that means is that part of becoming a conscious parent, a parent is to understand that you have to break free from the lies that exist in the matrix. All the lies, such as how to be a good girl, how to be a you know, beautiful woman, just in terms of females. Mm -hmm all the lies we've been told about motherhood and divorce and beauty and achievement, we have to deconstruct that at a level that only a warrior can and see the lies that we've been told for what they are and then choose to walk away from it. So in my own parenting, I remember being bombarded by the lies of the matrix, say, around beauty. My daughter, I have a daughter, so that was a really important systemic institution that I needed to deconstruct the institution of beauty because I did not want to pass down the lies that I had been told and I had indoctrinated onto my daughter. Oh, can you, sorry, Tim, sorry, can you break that down for me? How that actually goes? Because I want people at home to go, that sounds amazing. How do I actually do it? Right. So if you don't mind right. taking me through like identifying the lie, looking at Correct. it, like, can you take us Correct. through those steps? So as a parent, if you want to be conscious, you have to first understand all the institutions of culture that are ingrained in you, that you are going to unwittingly, unsuspectingly pass on to your children. The big ones are achievement, happiness, beauty, religion, um, love, marriage, divorce. These are the things that you are going to pass on to your children. So when I had a daughter, the first red flag that I needed to pay attention to was how was I going to show up as a woman in my body around my daughter, mm. which meant I needed to heal my own damage that culture had inflicted on me around how I needed to show up around beauty and my body. Did I embrace my body? Did I embrace my cellulite? Did I embrace my wrinkles? Did I embrace my whatever, my funny ears, my weird jaw, whatever? Because my daughter was going to pick up on that. So I knew I did not want to damage her with the lies that I had been damaged by. And that's because you realized it was damaging you. Yes, so and every female client and every woman I've worked with. So I knew mm. that this was a cage that I needed to break free from and not put it on my daughter. So I remember one time, and I tell this story often, um, my daughter, I was with a group of people and she came up to me and said, mommy, mommy, show everyone your wings. This, this, this. And she like began rocking the flab. And I was like, what is she doing? 
and I wanted to cover it up and call her a bad girl and send her to a room. But I realized that she was just loving it. I wasn't loving it, but she was. So I had a choice. Conscious parenting is all about the choice in the moment. So should I enter my ego and flip out and be all about my image? Or should I, this was a moment, embrace my body for its imperfect imperfections. There's nothing imperfect about it. But what culture has told mm -hmm. me, I'm not allowed to have. So I decided to step into it and I was like, I, you know, just swallowing the ego. And I was like, yeah, show everybody my flag. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and then I just made a joke about it. I was like, Maya, you know, so sad for you. You don't have wings. You can't fly. And I, and I just allowed it yeah. to be. And I didn't even say, oh, I love them. I didn't even say, oh, they're beautiful. Because I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. If I truly accept, I don't even have to give it a name. I don't even have to say they're pretty. They're beautiful. Right? This whole positive affirmation you know, trip that we go on comes because we don't accept. If we accept, I don't even have to say anything. I don't have to explain. The cellulite, I don't have to say, but it's beautiful. Hmm. I just accept. I don't have to say it's beautiful or pretty or give it any adjective because I accept. So in these little ways, I was very conscious of how I showed up in the mirror in front of my daughter, how I got ready in the morning. They are watching everything how I ate my, my food with gusto, or was I counting calories? Was I hard on myself? Was I saying, oh, I look too fat? Oh, I had to really be mindful. And I, and, I, and I made it my task. But more than that, I embraced it as a spiritual practice because I was forced to embrace myself. Mm. I couldn't just talk it. I had to actually be it, right? So that was one area. Then another area is around success, right? Oh, if we were high-achieving children, that message when we are parents is on steroids because an unconscious emblem of parenting, it's our motto, is to raise a successful child. No parent wants to raise a loser, <laughs> right? We don't, want, we don't want to raise an average Joe Schmo. We want to raise a superstar. Oh, my goodness. I thought I was like so easygoing, but I was type A in the first few years of my daughter's life. I wanted a high achieving kid. And it, because culture tells us that mm -hmm. we're supposed to raise a superstar. And it's a reflection of the parents. So if the kid is naughty, gets arrested, does all this stuff, oh my you're just like, oh, what's a parent yes. like? Yes, if the teacher sends a note back home, we feel mm. like we are in the principal's office. It's a carbon we copy, take I it, think you call it. Yeah, yeah mini me, yeah, yeah mini, mini me. We take it so personally, right? Because we want the, the superstar A plus, five-star child, you know? Absolutely. So we are trying to groom this child to not be ordinary. Like an ordinary child is anathema. We do not want an ordinary child. We're like, can you be good at something? Can you do something that I can put, post on Facebook, that I can, can I can, you know, put in a frame, something I can put on the wall? So this is a, an illness because we've been told as parents that we are mandated to raise a successful child. Mm -hmm. So Part of being a conscious parent is to deconstruct that lie because we have to really examine what is a successful child? How is success measured? Instead of raising a successful child, what I encourage parents to do is raise the child before you, not the child of your fantasy. Mm -hmm. You are not raising your cousin's child. You're not raising the child you were. You're not raising the child you wish you had. You are raising the child before you. Now, connect to that child's essence and allow that child to flourish in their essence. Let them be the lead a little bit, especially in their early years, to tell you what they like, what they don't like, and don't bombard them with things that you like. Now that is success. A child who follows their own inner governance, who learns to tap into themselves, who, who discovers that they are their own inner leader. Now that is a successful child, right? When we grow up, we want to be able to follow our own direction. We want to be able to say no to bullies. We want to be able to step out of the matrix. We want to be able to defy our boss if they are intimidating us. Well, how will we teach those skills to our children if we are telling them to follow the matrix, to get the straight A's, to follow the crowd, right? So we parents cannot have it both ways. If we want to raise that rebel, maverick, warrior, adult, it needs to start with them rebelling against us, mm -hmm. with them talking back at us, with them sharing their opinion and with us following them. 
How can we raise a leader if we've never even taught them to be a leader, right? That means we need to follow them a little bit. Mm. So that's success to me, is allowing the child to listen to their own essence, to understand who they are, to follow their own knowing, and to follow them in their lead. So when I took my child for her first horse riding competition, even though she told me she did not want to go because I wasn't listening, I wasn't listening. I wanted to raise a successful equestrian. So <laughs> really? I didn't care. I was like, that you was will go thing. on the horse because I loved horses mm -hmm. when I was a kid. I was like, you will do what I didn't do. I wasn't listening. She went for one competition. She came out of the ring. She did really well. And I was so excited. I was going to be a horse, you know, an equestrian's mom. Uh, she came out of the ring and she threw her jacket down. She took out her braids. She threw the helmet down and she was like, never again, mom, never again. And at that moment, I had a choice. My ego was like, why not? It's amazing. We just won a trophy. You should do it again. But I knew that if I wanted to be a conscious parent, I had already gotten my way one time by mm. pushing her into the competition. But now, if I didn't listen to her, then I would be teaching her to doubt herself. I would be teaching her that her feelings about things, her knowing was not important to me. Her inner knowing was of no consequence to me. So what did I want to teach in that moment? Was it about my ego or was it about connecting to my child's essence? And frankly, I had no choice because my daughter was just not <laughs> going to listen to me. So I had to be humble and surrender. So I had an opportunity in that moment to surrender my ego mm. and grow up and trust that even if my child wasn't a star equestrian, she was still a star in her own right. Right? I had to trust that in the ordinary was the extraordinary. So that's a big thing mm -hmm. that parents need to debunk. Let's go with happiness because every parent wants a happy child. Right? Yeah. Parents always tell me, what do you want me to say? I want an unhappy child. And what I tell parents is it's not, not your business. None of it is your business, happy or unhappy. Your child gets to choose how they show up in the moment to their life experience. If they choose to be happy, that's their experience. If they choose to be unhappy, it's their experience. How are you going to decide what your child's moods are? <laughs> but we parents have this belief, again, mandated by the institution of parenting, that we should make our kids happy. And you know what? It drives us crazy because we can't make them happy every day. So every time they're unhappy, we feel responsible, we feel stressed, we feel guilty, we feel anxious, and then we feel angry at them. Like, I did all this for you, I gave up my PhD, I could have been a ballet dancer, I could have been the best artist in the world, and now you're just crying all day? Like, did I do all this for you to cry? So then we guilt trip our children, we make them feel upset, we suppress their authentic experiences because we want to make a happy child, because we feel good when our kid is happy. Oh God, this is so powerful because it's so true, but I can actually understand, like as a parent, it's like, for, for heaven's sake, I've put my dreams yes. aside, right? Dr. Yes. Shafali says I can't have everything. So I put my dream aside. I did do it for the better, for the good of my child. I did do it for the health of them. I did do it for like, so that they can grow up and decide to be happy or choose yes. happiness. But now you're like, in all of my efforts, I've now not achieved what I've done. Yes. And so you do find that inclination to lean into, but what about me? Like at one point, yes. are women just sacrificing, sacrificing, <laughs> sacrificing? And I know you said yes. it earlier, but like, uh, maybe I just can't live in this world where like, but as women, when we've sacrificed, when yes. we've given so much over yes. to our child, when is it my turn? When is it yes. for me? When is yes. it like, I do need to find satisfaction somewhere in, this yes. dynamic. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So just touching upon that resentment we feel when our children dare to be unhappy a lot, when all we've done is invest in their damn happiness. You know how many millions of dollars we spend on our kids to be happy? We take them to Disney World. You know how many miserable children are at Disney World and miserable <laughs> parents? I feel for them because they've spent so much money, their life savings to make this epic trip and the kids are just unhappy. You know why? Because we think we should be raising a happy child. Mm -hmm. What we don't realize is that we're just raising a human. And humans have a lot of moods, especially when they're little humans. They have such capricious moods. 
such volatile, labile energies, you know, because they're highly reactive. Their executive functioning hasn't developed yet. So we think we're raising an adult or we're raising a happy adult, a successful adult. No, we're not. So that's why we need to think about this decision all the more carefully because these hu little humans, my goodness, they're constantly having moods and emotions and tantrums all the way till they're 28, mm. right? It doesn't end. <laughs> 48. So, <laughs> right, 48. So in terms of what about me, right? We, and I'm going to talk about mothers especially, mm. we as mothers have to, you know, tread that fine line, and it's a fine one indeed, between giving to our children our presence, our energy, our efforts, our entire consciousness, but also giving to ourselves. So the ways that we can give to ourselves are two. One is giving to ourselves through our children, meaning using it as a spiritual practice, mm. using it as a mindfulness. So when I was rocking my child at night for the umpteenth time, lonely, isolated, you know, no one's up at this hour of the night, just me. I could see my resentment building up, right? Mm -hmm. Going, what about me? My partner's sleeping, my mother's sleeping, or the whole world is sleeping, but this baby's keeping me up and I'm exhausted. What about me? Resentment. Or I could go the other way into, ah, oh, what is this teaching me right now? It's allowing me to be present. It's allowing me to feel connected. It's allowing me to be here in the moment with my beautiful child. So I allow it to elevate me, right? That's the choice, because if you don't have this other choice, you're in hell because it's one endless pit of resentment. So the what about me can be answered by using the relationship to teach you about yourself, learning about yourself, elevating yourself through the relationship. That's one way, that's the harder way. The other way is you have to carve time out for yourself. You have to have something that replenishes you. You know, you have to send your baby to daycare if you can afford it. You have to call in the troops, you have to call in help. Be helpless. Say, hey, I need help. You know, another thing a lot of us mothers do in the early parts of our journey is we want to be the only one, mm -hmm. you know, the superheroes. I can do it best. Well, that doesn't last long because you can't. You just absolutely need to go on your knees and say, I need help. So I, I called my mother. I called my mother-in-law. I used my friends to help me. Find a babysitter. Try to use your resources for that extra help so that you can then spend the time to activate your own sense of purpose, something that fills you up on your own. Your girlfriends are so important, other mothers, you need help. And trying to be this completely, you know, limitless being will come and kick you very hard. You need to just own your imperfection, own that you need help. Do not be limitless, do not be the savior, do not be the superhero. Own your limitations and ask for help. Do you think that's so beautiful? Thank you for that, by the way. As you were talking, I was like, do you think that we've somewhat female empowerment has done some damage to women in that sense of like, you can do everything, a girl. And yes. now the fact that we, we have, it's being perceived as you can do everything versus you have a choice to do things anything right and in the feeling of you can do everything when you can't it actually makes you feel badly about yes. yourself and now you compare yourself to other women where you're like well hang on a minute she can do it she can do it yes. i can't maybe i'm terrible yes i am kind of anti this slogan you can do everything because women take it to mean i must do everything mm. and i'm a failure or lesser than or less of a woman if i'm not doing it all the career the children the partnership the body what the charity work, the volunteer work, what all can we do? So I am against that slogan and I think it's actually causing a lot of harm in our psyches. I prefer women to believe they can choose to do whatever they want, but also they can do a lot, but not all together. <laughs> they can do one or two things in this decade, mm. another two things in another decade. And many women resent that. And then I tell them, well, then you don't have to be a mother. You know, if, if it's causing so much resentment, just the idea of it, then that's your signal, your red flag, that this may not be for you. It is not for everyone. You know, that maternal instinct is not everyone's instinct. And people need to have the choice to choose if they, if they wish to embody that instinct, if they wish to actualize that instinct. And in many traditional cultures, like mine in India, women are just expected to be maternal. But not every woman has that, and that's okay. 
They can be maternal towards their nieces and their nephews. They can be maternal in their garden. They can be the best chef. You know, women's maternal instinct doesn't all need to come out with a child. So you can express your maternalism in many ways. And I think it's a, it's a crime really for women to think that the only way they can be maternal is to have a biological or adopt a child. Mm. Oh God, I, I love your words, by the way, crime. I love the way you use that. And even in that word, the crime, it feels like if you're not, um, if you don't, if you decide not to have a, ch a child and you don't then flex your maternal muscle, then now you definitely aren't a female or you're not a woman, a real right. woman. Like right. a lot of people are getting a lot of backlash with these um, interpretations of um, who you are based on the decisions you make. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's just ignorance and a limited point of view. A woman who becomes a mother against her knowing, against her true consciousness, will suffer. Mm -hmm. So it is to her best interest that she truly check in with herself and go on a journey, you know, go on a retreat, really think about it for a year or two, because that is one of the most important decisions she will make, besides, of course, the partner she has. Mm -hmm. And the person she chooses to have that child with is a huge, huge choice that she needs to make with utmost mindfulness, because I cannot tell you how many parents, once they have children, right, the couple, once they have children, really, you know, fall apart. Because, like I said, everything becomes a, a difference of choice, a difference of value. And if they're not aligned in their philosophies on how to raise the child, mm -hmm. this child can be a, you know, huge buster of that relationship. It's, it seems like we're getting ourselves trapped a lot in the expectations either that we've had growing up or the expectations that we put on ourselves. And there are two expectations as you were talking that really hit me. There's the one expectation that when you have a kid, automatically you'll feel that love and that maternal instinct towards the child. And I've had multiple friends that have said, I didn't feel this. And so yes. for the first month, I thought there was something wrong with yes. me. I was judging myself because every woman out there said, when you have a baby, the, you know, you absolutely will fall in love with it more than you've ever fallen in love with anything on this planet. Yes. So that expectation when it doesn't happen can really impact us. And then the other expectation that I've heard recently was I've got a lot of female friends who are entrepreneurs and a couple of them have started to have babies. And one of them recently, massive businesswoman, has an epic company and she had a baby. She's like, I'm going to keep working. I'm, you know, like this kid is, I'm going to be able to do both. And then she has the kid. She falls in love with the kid. And the expectation that she had that she would still love her business is almost gone. And now on the side, she's like, I don't know what to do because this is my identity. I identified as a businesswoman. I wanted to have a kid. I was going to identify as the woman who can have a kid and work. And I didn't expect to not even care about my business anymore. So these two, even just these two yes. expectations of how they're trapping us, if you wouldn't mind helping us sure. like dissect sure. how we overcome this. Right. The first expectation, and I know every woman has this when they become a mother, is that there will be this automatic instant overflow of devotion. So then imagine when you're looking at your baby and you're not feeling that devotion, how devastating for that mother, right? She feels like she's a criminal, she's so evil, right? There were times when my child was like, yeah, hi, and I did not like her, right? It was my ego, but, oh, I was exhausted, or it was my hormones, and I felt so guilty. So what I want to say to those women who may experience that disconnect, they have to allow this, it takes time. It is not instantaneous. This is a lie that we've been told, that is just a switch. We are exhausted. Our hormones are out of whack. Our body is in shreds. When I first looked down on my tummy after delivering, I couldn't believe what I saw. No one prepared me for the wreckage, right? You just do not recognize your body. It's not your own body anymore. So the woman is going through her own psychic death. And she needs to allow for the space and the time. And that's why when we used to live in communities, this is my fantasy, the, the child was taken care of by the older women. So the new mother could embody that new process, that journey with time and space. Mm -hmm. But there is no time and space right now, right? In two months, she has to go back to work. She has to get her body back. She has to wear those waist snatchers and get her curve back. I mean, that's just insanity. But I would just let people know and women know especially, that that disconnect is normal. It's natural. You're not going to feel it. The baby is somebody you've never seen in your mm. life before. Maybe it looks like the mother-in-law you don't like so much. 
And you're like, I don't see myself. I'm like, who is this? Are you sure you have the right baby nurse? Right? Is this my baby? The ego again. Right, right. You don't, you, it takes time to develop that connection. And to expect it to be instant devotion is a lie. Let's talk about the other one where you had your whole life before you. You were an entrepreneur. You were so successful. You know, maybe, I've seen many surgeons give up their careers, many entrepreneurs, many, many women who are teachers, professors, dentists. Right now they have a baby. They never thought that they would give up their career. They never thought that the light of their spirit, their entrepreneurial spirit would dim. Mm -hmm. But now this baby is competing for their attention and their love. And I would say to that woman, allow it. It's okay. One is not better than the other. It's not a competition. It doesn't mean you're lesser than because now you're in love with your baby and you love being a mom. You know, I think the new, the new woman today almost has this idea that just being a mom is almost like a low class thing to do. Mm. Like, oh, you're just a mom, right? So you felt it because you didn't want to be a mom. But for those mothers who want to be a mom only, now they are being disparaged, mm -hmm. right? They are being scorned. Oh, you just a stay at home mom. There's so much beauty in that. There, it's not about like, oh, being a career and a mom makes you a full woman. You can choose a, a combination of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, only this, only that. We have choices now. But for the woman to feel lesser than by culture is really uh, an unfair thing. Mm -hmm. And we women need to fight back against it, right? We need to say, no, I want to be only a mom. I want to be a stay-at-home mom. Or I want to be a mom and an entrepreneur. You know, it's okay. My mom, you know, you can say, my mom is taking care of my, my baby during the day and I'm an entrepreneur during the day and a mom in the evening. We can find a way, but regardless, once you have a baby, somebody needs to take care of that baby. <laughs> right, yeah. So you have to find somebody who's wholesome, who's connected, who's wanting, who's willing. And uh, finding that right person is hard, but it can be done. Mm, yeah, and I, I think that's beautiful. And the thing that you keep echoing this episode that is so amazing is that it's okay. Like the expectation of doing everything, being this perfect mother, parenting in the perfect way, like always showing up, like it's just setting us, us, ourselves up for disaster. And what I love is exploring all these different avenues that we have. And now it's up to the person to then decide yes. on what type of life and person do you want to be. Yes. Um, and then uh, to really hammer home that expectation thing, it's so, I'm so grateful for you to be saying this out loud because when I was going through the struggle of deciding, there's the expectation of my family and my religion, right? Greek Orthodox, of course you've got to have it. You're going to have four children, yes. right? Nothing yes. less is going yes. to do. And you've even said before, like, I've only had just, just one just child. Just one. We should talk about that expectation. So go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so I had that expectation put on me. Mm -hmm. When are you going to have child number two? You're only having one child? Oh, your child is going to grow up antisocial. She's mm. a poor thing. Who's going to take care of her when you die? All this anxiety making me feel really lesser than. I, 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 had to, I felt like I had to apologize. I only have one child. I'm so sorry. Right? This is insanity. Again, a lie. My child is super social. She's just fine. And hopefully will be fine when I die. Right? Mm. So again, we are caught in these expectations that place these undue burdens on us that if we don't meet these expectations, somehow we are lacking, mm -hmm. we are failing. And we women now need to stand up to this, you know, push back. And then by the time my child was six or seven and I saw she was pretty normal, she was quite social, she was fine, I began to push back against this cultural indoctrination, this idea, this message, and talk about it. No, it's okay to have zero children, one child, six children. Mm -hmm. Everything is okay if it works for you. Mm. And my child is 20 now, and I cannot tell you how happy I am that I just had <laughs> one child. I'm, I'm done. One and done. It's great. It's, it, there's value to that, too. There's beauty there, too. Yeah, I love that the, um, like the decision really is up to you, and the comparison piece is super important because let's just embrace that none of us are the same. So your bandwidth... Dr. Shafali, exactly. all the things you can do, how you show up every yes. day, the amount of work yes. that you, the amount of hours you work, blah, blah, blah. I can't compare myself to you because then I think I'm doing a disservice to myself. And so as I was doing my decision making on whether I wanted kids or not, because I came from a world where I was like, oh, you can have four. Um, I'd already told Tom, got married, right. telling I wanted right. four children, was right. a stay at home wife for eight years, you know, you know my story. And so as I was trying to decide about whether to have children or not, going from four to zero, I started to think about, well, hang, hang on a minute. 
but um, Sarah Blakely can do it. Mm-hmm. Sarah Blakely can have a business that's worth right. over a billion dollars and she has four children and she has an amazing marriage, at least right. from what I perceive. Right. And it's like, but I'm not Sarah Blakely. Yeah. And even if it's easy for her, and I'm assuming it's not, but even if I'm in thinking it's easy, who am I and how am I? And the truth is, can I actually do it? Yeah. And instead of saying, well, if she can do it, then so can I. And then I decide to have a business and kids and then I find my entire life in disarray. Yes. I just, I think women in general should stop comparing themselves to what other people are doing and if it's possible and just say, is that the life I want? Yes. I love that you brought this up because this is for every human alive, but especially us women, because we put so much emphasis on what other women are doing and we pit ourselves against each Mm -hmm. other. And men do too, but for different things. But I think we do it for mothering, for our beauty, for our relationships, Mm -hmm. right? That's where we kind of compare ourselves with other people. And it is such a disservice because like you said, you are not only not Sarah Blakely or any other woman, your your mother wasn't her mother. Mm. So talk about how you were brought up. So that's what creates bandwidth. That's what creates your capacity to want X or Y. It comes from your childhood. So each person's childhood was so varied, right? I came from India. You came from the Mediterranean culture. It's so different. So we comparing mm. who the person is today is such a superficial glimpse into their world because they came from a heritage, right? They came from a whole cultural conditioning from childhood that we are not seeing. Mm-hmm. We're not seeing. Maybe Sarah thought she had to have four children and she went for it, right? Yeah, that's and true. And maybe now she's going, oh my goodness, why did I have four? We don't know. We're, we're not seeing the backstory, but we're not seeing the cultural story, the whole childhood piece. And so there's no point comparing who the person is today, right? You and I can compare each other today in this moment, but it would be such a superficial glimpse into the whole story because the whole story began generations ago, mm-hmm. right? So what came down the pike for generations is who I am today, my race, my ethnicity, my culture, my language, my country, where my parents came from, how they were raised, their traumas. So there's no point just comparing this little glimpse. And that's what social media has done, right? Mm. It's given us a glimpse into people's lives, these little windows, which is not the whole story, but we think it is. And then we feel, end up feeling really bad about ourselves. And our children are growing up on social media today. And I feel really bad for them because I know that this comparison culture is even more so now that they're being raised in it. And uh, we need to really help our children not get caught up in it like we do. Mm. You know, we get caught up in it. So imagine them. Yeah, yeah, I see how you, I've heard you call it the hallmark motherhood. Like we're not actually like we project yes. the type of motherhood that we're going to be. The or ha- sorry, the, ha- the hallmark version of parenthood. Yeah. Right. It's going to be this perfect vision. We're going to be loving to breastfeed our children. And imagine I was told that, you know, you're going to love breastfeeding. The first few times my baby didn't even latch. Mm. And immediately I thought I was defective, defective. Like what's wrong with my defective breasts, right? So it starts with the breastfeeding and the the rosy picture and we'll be this happy family in the home with the picket fence. I mean, it's just everybody's typical story. And we need to blast it Mm. out into the ether and just blow it up into smithereens because it doesn't work for everyone. And who said that that's even the way to a happy life or a joyous life? So many more women now are deciding to be child free. Um, Do you think that that is serving society or not serving society? If you're too nervous to speak up when someone disrespects you, if you're too embarrassed to ask for that promotion when you know you deserve it, if you want the confidence to go and ask that person for their phone number or the confidence to walk away from a bad relationship, no matter what you want confidence to do, it all starts with taking courageous action. That's why I created the 10 things confident badasses do to stay confident PDF, which you can download immediately by clicking the link in the description below. By taking these 10 steps together, you'll be able to say the things that you were too nervous to say and do the things that you were hesitant to do so that you can become the woman you've always known you can become. So guys, go grab your copy right now by clicking the link in the description below. Now, back to the episode. Well, it's a loaded question, right? If they're choosing to be child-free out of a consciousness and a true calling to their own inner evolution, versus 
it's the hip thing to be child free or now it's the hip thing to be an entrepreneur or to be a woman out in the male world, then it's as ridiculous a choice as they would make if they were having a child out of it being a subscription, mm. out of it just being a checklist box that they need to check off. So it's the consciousness with which the choice is made. And we have to really go within ourselves and make that choice with, with a full understanding of what this means. Because if you become a mother, but you're not ready to be a mother, and you have your 16 children, okay, yeah, you have contributed to society, I guess, in the census count, but you've raised them unconsciously. So we don't need more unconscious people, right? <laughs> we, we want children who are feeling worthy, who are feeling secure, who are not depressed, right? We want to try to raise them to the best of our ability that they feel a sense of inner connection. That can only come when you're conscious, right? Mm. So I, I would rather us put a stop to raising children mindlessly and having children unconsciously because then we're just increasing the senses, but we're not really adding anything to their life or to our own life. Mm. We're just How, being zombie parents. Oh God, it's so true in so many people. I think just because we haven't had to be honest, you around to tell us and make, help us get conscious in parenting. Um, how much of this do we need to discuss with our partners beforehand? Like, would you even suggest, and in fact, I'm gonna throw a thing out. I want people to read your book before they have kids. Of course. Of course. Because this could be the type of place where people can get aligned or actually realize they're not aligned as parents at all. And now you're having that discussion before you birth a child because, of course, like we've said, there's no returning the child after it's been born. Right. So in my generation of parents, we didn't talk about it much because I think many of us were on that automatic, you know, treadmill of this is what you do. Mm -hmm. So I didn't talk about it much with my partner. I wish I had. But having said that, no matter how much you talk about it, it's still something so unknown, it's going to take you for a spin. But at least you can begin to talk about your parenting philosophies, your parenting values. So important. Having discussions with your partner, period, about lifestyle choices, about philosophy choices, are so important because that partner is literally your greatest support or your greatest demise, mm -hmm. right? That relationship, that's why you and Tom did it right. You got that relationship right because that relationship is the most important relationship because that's your person mm -hmm. who's going to take you through all these other adventures of your life. So if you and that person are disconnected, then it's going to seep into your your parenting mm. and thank you for breaking that down that makes a lot of sense but then what about where you put them in your priority order and yeah. your list because from what i see a lot is that um i'm just going to be gender specific but of course it is not always going to be this way but the woman puts the child first immediately and then the the father doesn't automatically and so they're wondering what's happened to their partner yeah um because they haven't necessarily put the child above their partner whereas the wife has? Well, the, the female does that because if she's had the child biologically, those nine months, the connection is forming. It's very intense. Now, if, you have a, if you've adopted a child, you can also connect. You know, we females have different hormones and we connect. We have the love hormone and we connect very differently than the traditional male, mm -hmm. if you're talking traditionally. Mm -hmm. But birthing your own child is a phenomenal journey for the woman, where she's already connected with the child before the child is born. Mm. The, the male doesn't have that. So now once the child is born, it's an automatic, kind, not an instant, but it's kind of more of an mm. automatic connection because mm. she's been carrying the child. So she's very invested in this being. And for that poor guy out there, if it's a guy, mm. he's like, who is this person? He's not had that same biological foray mm -hmm. into the journey as the woman has. So that's why we invest a lot more because we have invested a lot more. Our body has, you know, taken, you know, given up its its essence for this child. Our body has given up its its uh, individuality for this child. Mm -hmm. It's allowed this child to be housed within it. So we're very invested. That's why mothers are like insanely invested in that parenting role much more than the father. But yes, then it impacts the relationship. And the father typically can feel left out. And yeah, they have to negotiate a whole new dynamic and it takes a lot of work. And, you know, typically then men could stray because they're not feeling like they're significant. They want to be seen. They're not being seen. They're replaced by this young being. This is such a common dynamic, I cannot tell you. Mm. I have so many young couples coming to me in trouble because of this shifting dynamic, you know. This duo has become a triangle. 
and it's it's like it's not yet on its feet and then it becomes a you know a square or a parallelogram and a hexagon and oh my goodness the poor guy not poor guy but you know he feels left out but the poor woman is handling so much as well so the the best thing is to go for couples therapy to talk about your issues early on and to have somebody mediate so that the woman remembers to prioritize the male and the male remembers all the sacrifices the female has gone through to mm. create this family that he is also benefiting from that's so important yeah because what from what i see with other couples again i haven't had my own children but i just see this becomes like almost like this bifurcation yes. where you have the woman that's like what do you mean i've just spent nine months of yes. giving birth to your child right. right like and it becomes like right. do you know what this is doing to my body i actually get that like yes. it's a freaking toll right. and if you just ask me to to like walk the arctic barefoot <laughs> nude for nine months i'll come back i'm like yeah you need Hello. to be giving me a pat yes. on the back i yes. just freaking did so that so he wants attention She she wants attention and that's where you need to really come together as a unit and realize that this is for us we're mm. doing it for us and yeah we're not going to be each other's you know front and center anymore but we can we can together do this beautiful thing together and it's so fun it's also so you know it's hilarious it's an adventure you know we're both messing up together mm. we're learning together no one's got it down pat but to keep that connection is even harder once you mm. have children. Oh my goodness, because you're exhausted and you're distracted and now you have to have sex and now you have to connect mm. and who has time for that? Mm. So all the more reason for the couple to come together, to communicate, to go to a couples counselor. Yeah. Because if you can do that, Dr. Shafali, right? Like it's the judgment thing that I think starts to make people like become opposing and so you know if you're able to have that communication in saying you know as the woman with well, this is how i feel i feel like i've you know done this for the both of us and then for also the guy though you know you said it earlier and i do think it's important to the guy is getting impacted and so there is no well he shouldn't feel left out we've just said there should be no shouldn't in yes, our lives yes. so if we think that about ourselves we should also respect the other gender in the same no yes. and so instead of putting judgment on them about how they should or shouldn't feel giving them space to say hey look i feel neglected there should be understanding right yes, like yes. okay i understand but i still feel like this and then how do we navigate this together i think yes. those people together yes. that now it gives space for the woman to be able to say hey i feel like i'm alone or i feel like i'm not connecting with the child yes. i need your input like to really have that honest and open discussion but then also leave in that space for the guy because like you said how many young couples did you just say that come to you and they're just like in trouble in trouble yeah they're dear in headlights because they could never have imagined that their relationship would combust mm. to this level so they have to learn techniques to come back together you know what was sexy for the woman before was a necklace now what's sexy for her is him taking the kids to the park and leaving her alone for an hour you know what's sexy for him was a you know hot night in 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 the bed but maybe now what's sexy for him is for her to applaud him in his role as a father you know mm -hmm. he gets pride in his, in mm -hmm. in him being a father so the what we found sexy before changes but we need to change with that we can't stay connected to who we once were you know that is the greatest obstacle of transformation is our resistance to the new and our deep attachment to what we were mm -hmm. no we're not that anymore now we're here with these children so how can we morph and transform into these new roles with embrace with surrender with beauty without judgment but if we're clinging on to who we used to be we're not going to be in the present and become who we are mm -hmm. right is that easier to do if you've been married for a shorter period of time or a longer period of time because i can call my, almost see both sides of it well it it's a crap shoot right because <laughs> if you've been together longer you would think you could ease into this better because but you no, got better but then you've been together longer so now you're addicted to that pattern right more. and if you're new you could say oh you know maybe that'll be easier because the patterns are set but then because the patterns aren't set now we're in more trouble right so this trouble either way mm. because these are little humans with x factors up the wazoo everything is an x factor everything is up for grabs you don't know moment by moment what's going to happen your children are in formation and you're evolving and you're young and kind of dumb so you don't know so you know like i'm 50 now if i had a child now Oh my god, I would be amazing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because I have all this life experience. Mm -hmm. I've checked off every box. Mm. Now I'm now I'm willing to sit back and be a, a mom. Yeah. But in your 30s, you you don't know much. 
right? So you're floundering, your identity is in question, and you're raising these little children who are in formation. Mm. You know what chaos that brings into your life? Everything is a crapshoot. Every day, imagine waking up every day going, it's a crapshoot day. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the next moment. Yeah. So, but also, can I tell you, that's where the spiritual practice is. That's what I took from it. Mm. I was, I want to now fully, consciously embrace the unknown that parenting brings. So raising a young child is a masterclass in embracing the unknown, a masterclass in being in the present, a PhD beyond belief of surrendering to the unknown and embracing the havoc, the chaos, and staying equanimous, right? It is, it is such a pivotal, valuable spiritual teaching that if you embrace it, then you feel like you're getting something out of it, like you're growing, you're learning. But if you don't embrace it, then you're just feeling resentful. You're just in debit, right? So you want to move from debit to credit. And to do that, you have to tap into the spiritual transformational potential of this journey, which it has in spades. And that's what I talk about in all my books. Oh, go mic drop. Where can people find you and your new amazing book and everything that you're doing? Yeah, I'm so excited, this new book. You know, I've written other parenting books, but never one like this. Mm. This is mm -hmm. the how-to. The others were the, were the what and the why, but this is the how to become a conscious parent. It has 20 steps, step by step. I give practice exercises. I have illustrations. I break it down into easy, digestible, real-life how-tos that if you read this as a guide, every day you read a chapter, within 20 days, you will be a transformed parent. So this is called The Parenting Map. I'm so excited for it. And people can find me at drshafali.com. I have so many courses. I have an institute um, where I coach people to become coaches like myself. Um, and that's where they can find me. Keep watching to learn exactly what it takes to have a successful, long-lasting, happy relationship. We're about to celebrate our 20 year wedding anniversary, baby. It's crazy. And so today I want to take apart the entire 20 years of our relationship and really- In an hour. In an hour, exactly. And really pull out the real big key things that have allowed us to be together for 20 years, but not just be together, thriving for 20 years. And so what I want to start with is the hard discussions, because even when you've just met someone, Having those talks, whether you've just met them or 20 years down the line, is going to dictate whether you're on the same page or not. And if you're, on, if you're not on the same page, then that's where I think relationships can start to derail. No doubt. So me and you have written 20, I think 26 hardcore questions um, that we answer, and it's a way of us really connecting. So I'm going to read a couple because we haven't actually done it in over a year. So I'm going to read a couple to you, um, and I want you to help... Um, not only just answer it, but give, tell me why you think it's actually an important question for people to ask each other. All right, All here right. we go. So this one is very specifically about desire. Word. If I was game for anything, what would a perfect day look like? <laughs> well, hi. Um, wow. Okay, so let's start with the easy part. The reason that this is an important question to ask is you need to really want to know what makes your partner happy. It is impossible not to put upon them the things that you like and to assume that the things that you like, you like because they are obviously good and wonderful. And when you realize with your partner that all the things that you resonate with, your love language, all the things that are self-evident to you may not resonate with them. And if you don't understand what resonates with them, what they want, where they're excited, then you can get into ruts. This is interesting because I would not have answered this question the same way 20 years ago that I am now. So um, as I think people that have been together for a long time can understand, you get into a rhythm. The rhythm is optimized for all the sort of peak things that you like, or at least sort of balancing out with all the things you have going on. There's something interesting about the human mind where it can, either one of you has changed and the other one doesn't realize that the rhythm now no longer works for them, or both of you are fine with the rhythm, but it's gotten boring and predictable and there is no spice and there's nothing different. Now, this is where, 
So those are all the things. You're, you're dynamic people. You're changing over time. You've got to constantly touch base. In fact, I guarantee the way that I will answer this question now, if we had a recording of me answering it the last time, it would just be different. Um, so knowing that you're a dynamic system, that you're always evolving, that's incredibly important. You have to want to know how to communicate well with them. I want to really press that idea for a second. If you know how I answer this question and you know sort of where my mind is at in this moment, then you can give me a gift or understanding that I will actually receive versus what you would want or what you would receive. So that's really important. Okay, so you're getting into love language, you're getting into the context of your life, and you're getting into um, neurochemical manipulation. So every everything in life, and I really mean everything, sleep, eating, um, friendship, work, love, it, it is all a type of drug. We take drugs because we want to modulate our neurochemistry. We're doing the same thing in a relationship. And so at different times, depending on what I need, I would want different things. But a perfect day for me, I'm thinking about how do I want to modulate my feelings? And that maybe is less esoteric than neurochemistry. I want to feel certain things, and that's ultimately what this is about. So I know that a perfect day for me is gonna be definitely focus on something that bonds us and brings us together. Now at the point in our lives where we are, where we're working so much, I am so hyper aware of the need to bond, take time for the relationship and do those things. So today I would want to start the day with you sitting between my legs, ironically the way that we actually started today, where I can smell your hair, I can smell your neck, which I know makes you feel like I'm steam breathing in your hair. <laughs> So she absolutely hates it, by the way, but I love that. I have a feeling it's, there's a similar neurochem, not, it's not the same chemistry, it, the same amplitude that women get from smelling a baby's head, mm. I get from smelling you. Mm. And it's like this, whoa, this big amplitude of like this complex ball of emotions of feeling safe, of being aroused, of feeling connected, of deep bond that I'm, if you were looking in my brain, it would be like a wet rag of oxytocin being wrung out. Like I just, there's so much complexity of 20 plus years together that goes into that smell for me. And smell is the one of your five senses that doesn't have a relay in the brain. It goes straight to the emotional centers. That's why smell will take you back to a barbecue when you were 13 in the way that nothing else will. Um, so that would be the start. Before you go on, actually, I want to address something you just said that we kind of, I laughed at, but it's actually really important. So yes, this morning you were smelling me. It was, I knew we had to shoot today and um, it was like right I on my braids. I was messing up your hair. Yeah, you were messing up my hair. It was like right on my braids and I could feel like the steam. Yeah. And you without, kept turning to look without at me. realizing yeah. it, I started to pull away. Yeah, yeah. And you obviously sensed it and I didn't even realize I was, it was so subconscious. I was like, oh, my braids, my braids, my braids. And you actually said something and you said, babe, like it's really comforting right now. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you for telling me. And so I, and you're like, I know you're just enduring it, but thank you. Those are the moments, babe. Those are the moments where if you hadn't have said anything, I wouldn't have realized I'm pulling away because I'm just thinking about my hair, right? I'm not thinking that you're having this like super special, I'm, I'm embracing the cuddle, but I'm not. Yeah, you were in a, different in a different place, yeah. whatever. For one, I had been up for hours by the time you got right. up. So I wasn't half asleep. Right. You were sort of half asleep. Right. You're, you know, yeah. it started with your hoodie up. And yeah. so. So we were in different places. Right. So no, we we're in different places. You didn't think badly. You weren't like, I can't freaking believe she obviously doesn't love this me. This is why asking these questions is so important. If I didn't know you, I would read that the way it would mean if I were doing it versus knowing you so well, yeah. I know what it means when you do it. Yeah, okay, so what would you have thought? Because I... the first time, and I will not go into details, but the first time that you uh, reacted like that, where you were pulling away from me at a surprising moment, I remember thinking I felt so rejected right? and when I, I was like, whoa, what was that? And you explained it and I was in hysterics. I was like, that's what you're thinking right now. But I now know that about you. So I knew one, because I have done my smelling, like where my nose is like in your hair. And you've said, oh, that makes my head feel damp because of the moisture in my breath. And because I know that, because you've told me, it was like the first time that I felt you like 
trying to look at me when I'm like, you know, in this really not intense moment, but like it was so lovely. I was like, oh, that's right. This is that whole like me smelling your hair thing. Um, communication. You have to be able to interpret them the way they mean it. And that's the thing. Because we've had the hard talks in the past, 20 years down the line, you don't feel rejected. You go, oh, okay, that's a, just a weird characteristic that my wife has. I'm just going to tell her this is what I need. And I didn't move. So all of those things have set us up for success for those moments. But you realize it's those moments where someone doesn't say anything. And then time goes by. Someone still doesn't say anything. Time goes by. And now over time, I start to perceive that as you just keep pulling away from me. And that becomes the crack in your relationship. The word that you said, I just didn't move. This was not me like pinning your head down <laughs> and smelling you as you like stand there rigid. You were actually really sweet about it. And you, you know, embraced me and um, that kind of thing. Because I was thinking, I think a lot of people would just be like, fine. But you weren't like that. So it felt lovely. Like, even though I was like, okay, I know that this is ultimately just for me. But you were warm about it, soft about it, welcoming about it. And that made it lovely. Whereas if it had been fine, like it would be horrible. But I see people do that a lot. And it's one of those where every time in our marriage where I'm disappointed with how I handled the situation, it's because I react the way I want to react to something that you want. Mm. So where, like, let's say you're telling me a long story and I'm like, baby, I totally get it. Like, what's the punchline? I'm never like, oh yeah, that was the right way to handle it. I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm stressed, whatever. So I'm trying to like move things along. But in those moments, it's always the times where I'm like, I'm so glad or I'm so proud of how I handled that is where I'm like, what would mean something positive and warm to her right now? Like, how could I react in a way where she'd be like, oh my God, that was so generous emotionally. Um, those times I feel good about. So yeah, it's a side step to what we're actually talking about, but that I think is really important for people to do. Yeah, and then just even in that situation, we always say, just want your partner to win. Like, what do I actually want in life? I want you to be happy. Like, I really want you to be happy. That is like such a goal of mine. And so when you are articulating what is making you happy, going, well, fine. That's a, I know that's not going to make you happy. Put yourself in their shoes. If you want your partner to do something and they are giving you like a bit of a sense that they're not keen and then you just articulate it and they say, fine, how does it make you feel? Does that make you want to do it? No, of course it doesn't. So if you can put yourself in their shoes, like in that situation, I'm like, well, you've just articulated what you're feeling right now. And at the end of the day, I always remind myself, I want you to win, meaning I want you to be happy. And then I do come back down to like, ultimately, what's more important? We had a very scary situation a few months ago where someone in front of us had a stroke and they sadly passed away. It was such a wake up call, babe, mm -hmm. such a wake up call. And I know I keep saying this to you, but when I think about those moments and I think about, God forbid that was you. I mean, it was all gonna happen to us, right? And I don't, I don't live in a scary mindset, right? I just remind myself so that I can remind myself of what's important. And so every so often I remind myself like, well, what's more important? My hair getting damp? Or you knowing that I love you and that I'm here to give you what you need to feel good. And when I think about that, and I think about um, the like, the difference between my hair and then that, it's like, it's, it's not a hard choice. And so, I think the relationship, prioritizing it and then thinking of it in different ways, even when it's inconvenient, is so freaking important. All right, I've got a few more. And Let's these go. are the ones where it's like, the things that I think are very important in a relationship, trust. So I pulled out a couple of questions that talk about trust. Let's do it. All right. Would you trust me in a room full of opportunistic and flirtatious people? Yes. Like I just cannot of all the things, mm -hmm. you being uh, unfaithful would be the most surprising thing in this universe. That would catch me off guard in ways whew, that I can't even begin to say. Ditto. The reason why I love this. And by question, the way, you would be super flirtatious with them. And I have no problem with that. That's like, actually, that doesn't weird me out. And you can attest for the people whether I'm a jealous person or not. That would not be weird for me in the slightest. So 
I love this on multiple levels. One, I know that's so true of you because I am touchy feely. Like that's just, I love hugs. I love people. I think that touching someone's arm is a way of communicating to them. Like I hear you. And so I don't actually realize I'm doing it sometimes. And I remember one time that when we were at um, one of like some bodybuilding event for Quest and there was a guy I knew and he was competing and he was standing next to me and I was just talking to him. And I didn't even realize I was just rubbing his forearm. And you saw it from afar and you literally just start laughing. And you're like, good job, I'm not a jealous guy. But you really did laugh and you didn't show any signs of annoyance, frustration or jealousy. But I think why this question is so powerful is basically saying, even if the opportunity came, right, and other people approach and other people were doing everything they possibly could to get you into bed, do I worry about it? Because if I worry, we need to talk about it. Because jealousy then obviously knocks onto the trust. And if you have zero trust in your relationship, then it, I just don't see how a relationship can survive healthily. I don't see why they're fun. If I didn't trust you, it wouldn't be fun. Relationships are sacrifice. You give up a lot to be in a relationship. Now, I think you get a thousand times more than you give up, but you give things up and they are at times a pain in the ass to have to think about somebody else and compromise and make sure they're happy too. Like it, there's a lot of compromise, but there's certain things need to be true for that to be worth it. Mm -hmm. And one of those is I need to feel safe. I need to feel secure. I need to feel like I can trust you. There are really few things that, and this one I may come close to taking for granted because it has always been the case with you, but I have never once worried about you being like unfaithful or anything like that. In fact, one of the earliest conversations we had was I may break up with you one day, but I will never cheat on you. And we both agreed that like, I can't, this was early, but I can't promise we'll be together forever, but I can promise that I will never cheat on you. So it was like word, like that felt good. Like you might come home one day and be like, look, I'm into somebody else. I've never done anything, but you know, this is the end of the road for us. But at least I never had to worry about that. And so and that- And being clear with the consequences, just want to add that. Mm. That where we both said, if, if you cheat on me or I cheat on you, like done. Like right. I'm out the door. There's no discussion. There's literally no explanation. Right. If it's a fact and it's true, you will not hear from me again. And that isn't a threat to keep you there. It's just yeah, a very yeah. clear line. And that's actually a very important dif dif difference, right? I'm not threatening you. I'm just saying, I just need you to know this will be the consequence right. of it. I hope it doesn't get there, but so that we can talk about things with our eyes wide open. No doubt. But sorry, you were saying. No, just that that is such a wonderful feeling to be able to trust you, to not worry about that. Um, because I can see a light. I mean, it would have been a string of what I call downward spiral choices, mm -hmm. but I could see a world in which I ended up with somebody who made me feel insecure for some reason that I can't currently fathom. I stay in that relationship and then I wouldn't trust them. And that would be a horrible feeling, horrid. Yeah, I think I would um, interpret it to be about me and so my insecurities and all the things that I've tried to work through, you know, over the last 20 years, I think would start to rear its ugly head again. Mm -hmm. I think I would start to think of it as being me and um, and then worrying. I mean, you know, many times, obviously growing Quest, it got to a point where you were surrounded by beautiful women. Um, you know, we owned a billion dollar company and you were the president. So it's like there were definitely women that would flirt. And I remember thinking, this isn't about them and it's not even about you. Am I confident in myself to actually trust you and to, to trust our relationship that we've built together and confident enough that if you ever betrayed that, that I would walk away and that I wouldn't then create some dialogue in my head about why you did it and that I should forgive you and don't worry, it's, all, it's my, maybe me, I am not, I'm not making an effort enough um, because we'd made the agreement that neither of us would ever do it. Like you said, it's like, leave me. Yes, if you're not happy and we've tried everything and I'm not the one for you or you find yourself really wanting to be with other people, like let's have that discussion and let's just separate. And I know it's never that easy. Obviously, there's a lot of situations, but me and you have had that endless discussion so that going back to the question, we know we don't ever have to worry about that. You can literally be gone. 3 a.m. and I think you're coming back at 10 p.m. and then someone sends me a photo of your arm around another woman and I'd just be like, oh, there must be an explanation. She must have had a hypothermia. That's so weird. <laughs> I, like, wow, did they get caught outside? And now here's the thing that I do want to be very open about. 
I recognize that a lot of people watching this right now mm. who may have been in the same situation as me and they've been stung and they've been hurt and they've been crestfallen because they've had the same belief as me. And I actually want to say, I understand that. And yet even knowing it's still a possibility, right? Like I don't control you, but I, I, I've decided to put that amount of trust in you. And if you ever broke it, I don't know if I could ever come back with another person because I so wholeheartedly trust you. Mm. But to me, that has been important, important for our 20 year relationship. Trust. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So for maximum value to audience, what do you advise to somebody that has had heartache in the past and wants to have a functioning relationship because I would say you can't bring the baggage from the past. Yeah. So how do you get to a position where you can open yourself? Because if I put myself in the position of year 21 and you do cheat mm -hmm. and I see it with my own eyes. So it's not like, oh, right, it's a misunderstanding, right, right. like for real. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be that would have blindsided me so hard. Yeah. I have no indication that that's coming, which means the next time I'm in a relationship, I'm going to have in the back of my mind, but you didn't see it coming last time either. A hundred percent. Right. I literally battle over this and I actually don't have an answer. And that's the worst thing. Like I would have to explore. I would have to look really deep in myself to actually say, um, are there any things that I saw that I subconsciously ignored? Right. And maybe there wasn't. And now how do I? I would absolutely seek therapy. I would absolutely spend time on my own. I wouldn't get into another relationship for at least a year. I would do all the internal work because I'd only bring that to another relationship. And I've just interviewed too many therapists and psychologists on the show to, to know that jumping into another relationship wouldn't help. So all the lessons that I've learned from interviewing women on the show has been take time for yourself. Don't get into another relationship. Look inwards, identify the wounds, heal the wounds. And then I would then with new partners very be very open and articulate exactly my last relationship and let them know you know if it was but you know going to be serious that I, I would have to in real time work through this because i um i've done all the past work but that doesn't mean that i'm not gonna get triggered again that doesn't mean that something's not gonna come up and having told your new partner that, so they're not surprised that all of a sudden you freak out over something, we're like, oh my God, I can't believe how crazy she is. I did this one thing and she freaked out. It's like articulating that to your new partner so that they can help you build that trust back, I think is how I would handle it. I like almost everything you just said. And the only part that I will say differently is that I think as you go into the new relationship, I would ask for grace. There's no question, yeah. but I would not think it okay for me to bring the baggage from my previous relationship to the new relationship. And I, the story I would tell myself, and I think this is really important, mm. is that what makes love worthwhile is that you are in a position where they could devastate you and they don't. And it's the tension between that. It's really being able to be yourself and to be um, loved and not where they're like, everything you do is amazing. Like it isn't that. It's that you know that you can be yourself completely, that they are, they get so much out of the parts of you that are like high functioning or you know whatever the right word is, that they're willing to look past uh, some of the other things, like the fact that there are definitely times where I'm like, yeah, 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 like, get to the speed, point. Speed up the story here. Um, that there's enough on balance, you know, that you really take that person in and they've meant so much to you and they bring so much to you and all of that. So, but I don't think that you can have what makes a relationship worth it and be guarded. I don't think it's mm. possible. And so I think that for my own sake, and I, what I loved about your answer is there was nothing about the other person. It was all about you, yeah. wisdom. And so I think going into that next relationship, you really have to be able to put it aside. And if you can't, you will destroy every potential opportunity that you have moving forward. Mm -hmm. Nobody else. And that is, I say that knowing that that would be ruthlessly difficult, but that, that's the very thing that will make it worth it. Mm.
In talking about insecurities, actually, the th one of the things that we really talk about and it's so important in our relationship that we repeat it over and over, is not using the other person's insecurities as a weapon. So big. So that's a big key, if you don't mind talking about that. 100%, I mean, this is really an important idea. And this is one of those ideas that you and I found early. I'm so glad we found this early. And I think part of it is just empathy. Like, I don't like to see other people be mishandled. I don't like cruelty. That's a very fast way to sum it up. I fucking hate cruelty. I try never to be cruel. I have hurt people. I've tried never to be cruel. Mm. So it's not like I say, oh, it's okay to be cruel to other people if they've been cruel to you. Mm -hmm. I'm saying cruelty is just not on the table. Mm. It's gross. It's icky. I don't, I don't want to be tainted in my own mind that I have been cruel to somebody. So on your worst day, I would never use your insecurities against you as a weapon. And 20 years in to that reality of you knowing in, in my pocket right now, I know the things that I could just and cut you in ways that you may never heal from. Mm -hmm. And even though I have that nuclear weapon in my back pocket, I've never used it once. There's nothing that would indicate to you that I plan to use it in the future. In fact, if anything, it becomes less likely that I will use it in the future with every passing day because I've had so many opportunities to win an argument or get what I wanted or whatever. And never once. Like, we've been in arguments where yeah. we both know, oh, they know exactly what they could say right now to shut me down. Yeah. And they're not saying it. And mm -hmm. that is so powerful. I mean, that's the thing, babe. You can't take shit back. Like... I was so aware of that when I realized you were the one to go, what are, what are the ways that this could mess up? Like, right? What are the ways that I could lose you? Because again, I always think about the future. What is that goal? Like, I really want to be with you to my, till I take my last dying breath. And that means it's going to be hard work. Everything we're talking about right now, it's like you have to rinse and repeat, practice, rinse and repeat. And I always thought about what are the things that we can improve on and where, what are the ones that are no going back? And cheating's a no going back. Um, physical violence, there's no going back on that. And then using the other person's insecurity and saying something that you deliberately know is going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I'm a hothead. So in arguments and debates, I knew, I may not mean to, but it's actually quite easy for me to, in defense, if you would hurt me, just being picked on when I was a kid, like having that like back up where it's like, okay, I'm at the ready with my fists up. Um, I remember thinking to myself, you can never take shit back. And once you say it, like that's it. You, It's not even the words that you say, it's the fact that you are showing the other person that you are willing to use that thing that you said you never would. Yeah, that you can't be trusted with yeah. it. So it's not even the words, right? It's the trust of someone giving you their, um, their truth, their, you know, honesty. And can we get into like a weird part of this, sure. which I think is actually really interesting. Yeah. In those different states, right? Because the time where you're confessing an insecurity or whatever, you feel safe. Yeah, That's why you're doing it. And it's the fact that, oh, I see. So I, when I'm safe with you, you can change though. Oh. And now hiding in that person who's making me feel safe right now is a dangerous person who will use as I have the chills who will use that against me and that's like that ultimate betrayal yeah. of it's interesting so Jordan Peterson talks about this how it's not right to think of a mindset as like a, a you have this external thing it's that it's a micro personality so when you're hungry it's a micro personality. You're very different, right? You act differently. You think differently. You may have a shorter temper when you're hungry, whatever. Same when you're tired. It's a micro personality. People with addiction issues becomes a micro personality. And that micro personality can take over in any one time. So when you're having this deep connection, right? We talk a lot about being unguarded. And so when we have things that we really want to discuss with each other, we don't just blurt it out at any moment. It's like there's kind of a window of, you know, like two or three days around where it's like, I really need to talk to her about this, but I'm going to wait for a moment where she's unguarded. There's like a real sense of connection and trust. And then I'm going to broach something. And what's really going on there is we've both synchronized into these micro personalities of 
like that holding that space for trust and empathy and connection. We're really feeling it. We really want the other person to win all of that. And if you ever feel like in that moment, the dark side of their personality is lurking, like, yeah, 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 give me that information so I can use it against you later. Oh God, that'd be horrible. It, it, that's why frenemies are so terrible because they want you to, yeah, 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 give me that friendship juice so that I can use it against you. Like, it's just an absolutely atrocious feeling. When you know that you're dealing with a bad person, you just don't give them the tools. It's when they're both good and bad that you now have a problem. And so I'm just gonna capstone that by saying that's what makes not using somebody's insecurities against them so important because what you're saying is, at my worst, I still don't reach for things that are going to hurt you. All of my micro personalities, you're safe with. That's so strong. And as you were talking also, I was thinking for me, and I can't speak for all women, but I think this is quite a female trait. Um, when that happens, I then beat myself up about the fact that I freaking trusted you in the first place. It's like, for heaven's sake, right? And now the, the loop of the negative thoughts of not just like, oh my God, you trusted him and he, they used it against you. But it was like, I shouldn't have freaking done it in the first place. What was I thinking? I knew I shouldn't have, right? And now it's like, you couldn't trust your own feelings because in the moment you thought you could trust him. So see, now you can't trust yourself, Lisa. And now it becomes this whole like internal self-blame of myself, but it's something that you've done. But now I'm blaming myself for trusting you in the first place. Yep. And I mean, it is good to look at yourself and what you could do differently, but it's a very careful line you have to walk between looking at what you could do differently versus beating yourself up. Right, exactly. And to be honest, there are cruel people out there. There are narcissists out there that are willing to put on the face and they're doing everything and saying everything right. Mm -hmm. So even just, I mean, look, we're all about self-assessment, right? Me and you and like going back and really taking ownership. So I would absolutely still do that, but I wouldn't necessarily just blame myself, right? I would look at the, the situation as it really is is identify how can I make sure that I don't get trapped in this in future but um, not taking on the blame and shame myself as a negative but as a learning lesson yes yeah agreed all right got a couple of more hard Let's questions um, so we covered design the honesty about desire communication trust and now I want to talk about the hard truths and communicating the hard truths what is the one trait you thought you wanted that I don't have that you wanted in a partner. Yeah. Oh, Why is the man. question powerful? The question is powerful because again, this is, you want to know where the other person is. And there's one thing that people need to really understand and it's, they're already thinking it. So the only thing that you're protecting yourself from is knowing what they're thinking. So true. When I, when I heard that about radical candor, it's like, People don't make it up to say it to you. They're already there. You're just asking them to be honest. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. So it's important to know because they're already there. They're already thinking it. That's already a real thing for them. Um, and one, if I'm empowered with the knowledge, it might be something that I can actually give them. And so then it's like, oh my God, I had no idea. Like that, that's a thing for you because usually what it is, is just a disconnect between something that you would receive well and what I would receive well. It's not that I don't wanna be what, you know, would be exciting for you or whatever. It's that I have a default mode, you have a default mode, and they don't always result in giving the other person exactly what they would want. And so knowing what the other person is into is really, really powerful. Um, I actually don't have an easy answer for this one. There have been times though in our lives where I would have a very quick answer. I will say there is something that you used to do for me that you don't do anymore. And that is I miss being nurtured the way that you nurtured me before going into entrepreneurship. And that was, I had to mourn that now you really want to see me happy mm. and as you were saying that i was like oh my god like seeing you happy makes me so fucking happy and like seeing you work on the book has been amazing you are so happy you're having so much fun and one we will play this clip because i i will just tell you right now from a social following perspective you are always meant to be have a way bigger audience than me and like we are racing towards that you were just like gaining so much momentum and I said that two years ago, 
I was like, oh, homie, you're going to be way bigger than me. So seeing the way that you light up and, and being able to connect with people, especially other women, and like seeing the way that they respond to you, that makes me so happy. You have no idea. So it's been that trade-off. So I do miss that. I'm not crying myself to sleep at night. I don't like lament it. But yeah, that is something that if I were going to say, oh my God, I have this woman who's fucking incredible. Could I optimize even more? Like that would be something that, yeah, would be awesome for me. But I don't often think about it. It's such a tricky question. When I say tricky is you have to definitely have the openness to discuss it and not take it personally. Because like you said at the beginning of the question is it really is about maybe it's something I can do, right? And look, there's no pressure. I don't have to do it. You are with me. And if right. I say, hey, this is something I'm never going to do, now it's up to you that a relationship you can be in or not. Um, but going to wanting to make the other person happy, if it's something that I can do that maybe I didn't realize, now you've just enlightened me. You've brought more knowledge and maybe you just didn't want to say it, right? And this is, let's go to me being a housewife and then an entrepreneur, is if you never told me that you missed the nurturing or that was something that was going to be hard for you to let go and that we need to mourn together and how do we do it together and how do I wean you off, as I like to say, where instead of putting your clothes out seven days a week, I did it five days, then three, then two. Um, that was how it, we were able to get there. We were able to do it together. There was no, hey, this is what I'm doing. You just have to tag along, right? We were on board. We did it as a team. And then you just being honest about how that was impacting you and me not taking it personally. And even just the way you explained it all, it's like, you, I feel you wanting to champion me. So I don't think of the other thing as a negative, but it is also a way of delivering it, right? And just how you delivered it makes me go, oh my God, of course I want to like, you know, um, cook your dinner and take care of you on the weekends. And it's like, that's the happy medium that we have come to where I still get to do it. And you say to me, hey, this is really meaningful if you do this. It then gives me the space to be able to do it. Instead of blinking a year, two years, three years down the line, me thinking, well, he supports me. Like he's always supported me in business and then finding out that there's something that you're unhappy with. Mm -hmm. um, that I could have gone, wow, I could have done that. Like it doesn't mean that I have to completely transition back, but I can make the effort an hour a week, make him some dinner, you know, like whatever. I think a lot of people get themselves in trouble because of one simple idea. I want them to know that it's important to me. I shouldn't have to tell them. Oh. oh my God, people derail on that. Like that makes me so sad for them because you're so close to having everything you've ever wanted. All you have to do is tell the person because they don't see the world like you see it. It's not like they're sitting there thinking, I know they want this and this means so much to them, I'm just not gonna give it to them. And so when people think, oh, you're thinking and feeling exactly what I am, but you're just reacting in a different way, which makes that action then seem spiteful. And so people feel rejected and unloved and a lot of this, I hate that this is true, but a lot of this comes back to parenting style and their attachment style. And so if they have historically felt abandoned or whatever, then they're gonna bring that into the relationship. But if on the other hand, instead you're thinking, okay, they're seeing the world totally from a different perspective and it absolutely makes sense to see it from where they're coming from. Can I steal man their position? Do I know what they're going through? Like, do I know how beautiful or wonderful or whatever this thing is? Or maybe they just, just not even thinking about it. It isn't meant as a slight, like they love you. And if you told them, they'd be like, whoa, okay, amazing. Like, let's find a way for me to give you what you're looking for without feeling like I've just given up myself. Mm. But if you don't say what it is that you want because you're waiting because you feel like they should know what you're thinking and feeling and you shouldn't have to tell them, yeah. it's like, it's, it's, it is literally like a cellophane veil between where they are and the world that they want to live. All they have to just poke through. And like that one thing. And just to add to that, you know, I think a lot is like, well, they should be happy for me, right? Like he should want this for me. Instead of acknowledging, yes, you do want this for me, 
but you're a person and you're, you've got their feelings and you've got the emotions. And right now, the first step is you need to mourn the transition and the change. And if you can't vocalize that to me, and I'm like, well, what's wrong? You're not happy for me, right? And now you're putting on a fake front and I can sense it. And I'm like, wow, there's something wrong and he's not quite being, you know, and now that's how you then start separating, right? Because I'm like, well, I'm so excited. He, you know, I'm not sure why he's not. And you're just like, I'm excited for her. I do feel sad and I am gonna miss this. But I can't say it to her because she's going to think I'm not happy, right? And now you sense these dynamics between you, but neither of you are saying it. Mm. And I think one of the biggest things that me and you have done is mourning either the people we thought we were going to be or each other. So for me, I had to mourn the thought that I was going to be a mother, even though we decided and I was 100% on board with not having children anymore. I still needed to mourn the person I thought I was going to be and the, the mother that I thought I was going to be. Mm and allowing yourself that space to then mourn it so you can move on, right? Because if me and you hadn't had those open discussions about me changing, if we hadn't had the hard truths that you said, hey, look, this is gonna be difficult for me, you know, and you still saying that, like, yeah, I do still miss. It's just a great reminder. If we hadn't have done all that, I think resentment would have just built. And we know, you know, how we feel about resentment in a relationship. It just like, it be can become the absolute breaking um, in a relationship. So allowing each other that freedom to be open, to be very honest, to openly communicate um, these transitions, I think has been massive for us with no judgment. And so when you said that to me, I didn't take that personally. I didn't think, well, he doesn't want my happiness. I just go, okay, he really wants this. And that's, you know, you didn't say it was important to you, but you said, I'm missing this. So now every week I do, I make an effort and like on a Saturday and a Sunday, you know, I'll put food together for you and that makes me feel good. Me too. All right. So I got, um, so that's the hard truth. So we've covered desire, trust, hard truths. Um, and now here's a very hard one. So we wrote these questions out in order of difficulty so that you can lean into it and go, yep. But we're always about, let's just get to like really hard ones. Let's do it. Deep in. All right. What's the one thing I could do that can make you reconsider our entire relationship? Ooh, there are actually several things that you could do that we've already talked about today. So one, if you were unfaithful, that would be very traumatic because I just, I have no signs of that whatsoever. Um, if you did use my insecurities against me, that would be really horrible. And if you became mean-spirited, like that would not be fun. And if you detached from like right now, even though you're like hardcore entrepreneur, go do your thing, we work so much, but I really feel like you want to be my wife, like totally removed from success or business or anything like that. And maybe even more importantly, I feel like if life set it up such that you had to make a choice that you would choose me. And that I is the fucking house to the ground, homie. But that's I would that would make in... me reconsider things if I felt like you wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean look, that's actually really interesting. Cause you're right. We have like the non-negotiables, you know, cheating and things like that, but that's very emotional and you're right. It's like, we have decided that we are each other's priority. And if I ever felt like something got in the way with that and in the way of that, now look, our hours are not spent mostly together in our relationship, right? It's built on the business. So I don't even think about the hours spent. It's just knowing that if I needed you and I said, hey, you need to drop things and you were like, I can't cause I've got a, you know, work or whatever that would be a real problem because we've always been in it together and we've always said, no matter what, we're each other's priority. And actions speak louder than words, right? We say it, but if you started to act not in accordance, I think that would be a real problem because now our desires and our main goals aren't aligned. And if I'm willing to literally burn the house to the ground, burn the business, like I, I, I wouldn't even think about it, babe. Like, honestly, you are the most important thing in my life fucking period. And so I have no conflict over that. But if you did, it's like, well, hang on a minute. Now we're actually not giving equal to the relationship. Uh, that'd be horrible. Yeah. Horrible.
So I think having these discussions up front, because you you even said it earlier, no one's a freaking mind reader. What's something that to you you may like, wow, that's a non-negotiable for you, or that's the breaking point. It may not it may not be for me or for you. And so making sure we're on the same page that we know each other's um so important. That is extraordinarily good advice. Want them to win, give them the keys of the kingdom, set them up for success, like don't test, don't trip them up, no booby traps. Yeah. Makes a big difference. All right. Now, one other thing that I think is huge in our relationship that we have um, implemented very often is disruptors. Because I'm sure anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows that very often arguments could get fiery and they end up derailing. And from what one thing seemed like a little bit of a, you were just bickering, mm. you know, at first at dinner ended up being a full time row and you're pissed for like two days. Um, and then it's like, where did all that time go? Time is so freaking precious. And so for us, a big thing has been introducing disruptors into our relationship. Like pattern interruption. Yes. So you, I would say, are the queen of when the argument happens to make sure that you interrupt. Like I would rather keep going and just have the argument out and it is what it is. Um, but you're very good at saying, you know what, I think if we stepped away for just a couple minutes and came back that this would be much easier. And that is universally true. Um, but we have also worked in some tools. I don't feel like we struggle from this very badly anymore, but we, before we even knew the phrase pattern interrupt, we had a pattern interrupt, which I actually see that you brought with you. Um, that was really important because to your point about, I never once got in an argument with you and thought, oh, that was a really good use of time. It's always like, you end up getting annoyed and you end up losing like most of a day. And it's like, oh my God, like this is such a waste. And so we came up with the idea of the love token um, as you came up with the idea of the love token. Um, I will show people at home. There it is. As a thing, because you were asking yourself in the middle of an argument, do I believe that he loves me? And as long as the answer is yes, then I know we'll get to the other side of whatever this argument is. Um, and so we used to each carry one of those around. And look, we were in our 20s, you know, not as good at emotional management on our own side. And so to avoid that, we would give each other that coin and that you had an obligation to the marriage. And the obligation was if somebody pulled out the love coin, which they would not do lightly, I, what, did you give it to me once, twice, yeah. ever in our entire yeah. marriage? And the second, the second they gave it to you, instantly, boom, you changed your neurochemistry. Because we had talked that we control our moods. Oh, really? Well, then, if you control your mood and I give you this coin, you ought to be able to, on a dime, immediately be like, baby, and completely let it go. It is the most extraordinary trick. And so then we got to the point where we didn't feel like we needed the coins, but that either one of us at either time could go like this, baby! <laughs> and the other person, no matter how angry you were, the only acceptable response was, baby! baby! <laughs> and so you had to do it back. That's worked so well. It's really, I know people watching at home are gonna be like, that's really silly. That it's... works so well still to this day in our marriage. Yeah, it's because the amount of times we got into ridiculous arguments, like heated screaming. I mean, do you remember or the even the ones that are legit? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. They all feel legit in the time. Right. Right. You it's... were about to say a good one, though. Remember the time? Oh, remember the time when we were in Amsterdam and we got into an argument oh my God, and I yes. stormed off and got lost? Yes. That was <laughs> that so was hilarious. So it wasn't like we can be like, all right, where are yep. you? So we got into this freaking heated argument. We've been looking forward to it. It was before we had like, it was before we oh, got married. So poverty, I saved poverty. every penny to take you on this trip. Yep. And literally we spent hours arguing and then hours apart. And so I was like, there's got to be a freaking better way. Like this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Because when you make up, which most people do unless you actually break up, when you make up, you literally feel all oh, the chemicals are again. You're like, oh my God, I love him. You know, and so all the, the annoyance and the hate that you maybe initially mm. had is completely gone. It doesn't feel real to you anymore. So in those moments, I like, would reflect and be like, what the fuck? Like, this is a, a time is so precious. Yeah. Like, we had spent money, you know, we'd saved up, we'd gone on this trip, and it was like, and we've spent half of it not together, upset with each other. 
And it just felt like, okay, well, if you can control this situation, right, you can control how you react to situations and your conversation. What are the things that we can do to snap ourselves out of it? Because it does take a snap. It's like, you know, the thing where it's like you're in an argument and the phone rings when you're like, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. You know, so that is an example that you can disrupt and change your mood. It may yeah. not feel real, but you can change how you're outward, you're speaking and your tone. Yeah. So we were like, how do we do it? And I needed something physical. So I found these love tokens at some random store and I was like, this is actually a good size. I put it in my handbag and I was like, I just need something. You need the olive branch. And then we sat down and we said, what do we place meaning? What's the meaning we place on this chip? And you just expressed, right? It means this. It means that no matter what I'm saying, I know you love me and I feel like we're arguing over silliness and I'm reaching out to you. And so agreeing what that means, agreeing how then you respond to it, like you said, with the baby, um, we've agreed all those things. And so we've set them in place so that when we're in the argument, when it happens, you don't feel like screaming, baby. You do not and feel you, like screaming, and baby. And I remember once where you didn't reciprocate. And then, so I got mad and then you realized, shit, I, I can't believe I didn't reciprocate. So you came to me and I was mad at you. And you're like, well, babe, now you're not reciprocating. Right. And it becomes a spiral. And then we just started laughing because it was like, oh yeah, shit. Well, hang on a minute. This now just becomes an effect where you're each just affecting each other right. and now no one wins. And so the fact that you were like, this is ridiculous. And then I just laughed. Um, but those are the things you have to do. Because if you don't, you end up in a, either a death loop of that specific argument or it becomes a pattern in your relationship. Mm -hmm. And there's no way out, there's no solution. And that's the thing, me and you go, okay, we're, we're in a difficulty now, you know, with, around you know over the 20 years there are phases in your relationship and so whatever phase we're in we address the phase and we look to see what the problem is and then we come up with a solution of what that problem is preach and disruptors were a big one no doubt yeah that that has continued to serve us well all right bill you where can people find you <laughs> uh, i'm always sad when these end uh at tom bill you all everywhere right. everywhere and guys if you freaking love this tom and i do do relationship theory we have a channel on youtube where we take subjects and we go deep on them but thank you baby for coming thanks on. thanks for having me oh, i always I love, love being with you on. guys guys if you're not subscribed click that subscribe button down there and if you're not following me follow me at lisa bill and until next time be the hero of your own life peace out click here right now to learn how to find and keep Real, true love. They've had bad breakups. They've dated the wrong person. They've struggled with connection. Maybe they've been abused, whatever it may be. And one question I'd always ask people is,